It was a Saturday morning, the day after Valentine's, and I was walking down the street in Brooklyn in the middle of a snowstorm, wearing a sign that said, here to listen. And for a while, the only thing that I could hear was the sound of snow crunching under my boots, which was almost loud enough to drown out some of the doubt running through my head. Hafa, what are you doing here? <laughs> it's cold. It's snowing. Shouldn't you be inside doing something productive, like learning to code or something? What kind of person goes out in public wearing a sign that says, here to listen? What kind of person talks to a person wearing a sign that says, here to listen? What if they just think I'm really weird? And then I turned a corner, and at the other side of the block, there was a woman standing behind her stroller, and I thought, oh God, she's gonna run away. <laughs> but instead, she cracked open this huge smile and said, oh honey, don't get me started. <laughs> this was part of an experiment that I run with two friends. Adam Horowitz and Leanne Walden. Once a month, we get together with some other people and we take a step back from our lives. The expectations that other people have of us, the expectations that we have of ourselves, and the rules that we live our day-to-day -day life by. And when we do that, we get to choose a different set of rules to play by. We get to choose a different game to play. In high school, when I was younger, the idea of choosing how I wanted to live was totally foreign. I had two obsessions. I was obsessed with looking for the truth, capital T, and individual success, the game of individual success. And for a while they were the same thing because I wanted to be a scientist. And I didn't want to be a scientist because I thought science was cool, though it is. <laughs> I wanted to be a scientist because I thought scientists knew the truth, capital T. And if I wanted to find the truth and achieve success, then obviously the best way to do that was to be a successful scientist. So in my junior year, I wrote a paper that said we were all walking, talking pieces of meat. <laughs> and then I had to defend it in front of an audience and a panel of teachers. And one of my teachers pointed out that despite my obsession with truth, I wasn't really questioning science a whole lot. <laughs> I didn't know you could do that. I thought, well, it's in the textbooks. It's in the scientific journals. It's in the peer-reviewed scientific journals. Of course, it's true. But he planted a seed. And then I went home and stumbled across a quote by a philosopher named Paul Feyerabend. And Feyerabend says that scientists defend their theories like savages defend their gods. And that hit home. It felt like my world was, cr was crumbling under my feet. I didn't know what to do. I was trying to play the game of individual success and I didn't know what that meant anymore. Because if science wasn't the truth, then I didn't necessarily want to be a scientist anymore. And I didn't know what I did want to do. So I went to college and was looking for the truth. And I was really hoping that by finding the truth, I'd also figure out what the heck I should be doing with my life. But I didn't find it in philosophy. And then I didn't find it in psychology or history 
or religion or the arts. And on a drizzly October afternoon, I was standing in the rain and realized that I had nothing, that I'd lost the game of looking for the truth. And then, then I started to laugh. And I started to laugh because if I'd lost the game, it meant that the game was over. I didn't have to play it anymore. I could play a totally different game. I could make up what I wanted my life to be about. I could choose how I wanted to live. And that thought was also terrifying. Because if I got to choose how I wanted to live, well, then I had full responsibility for those choices. Then I was the only person to be held accountable for what I'd do with my life. And without truth, how would I know that I was doing the right thing? How would I know that this is the thing that I should devote my life to? I didn't know. And all around me, my friends were getting jobs. They were winning the game of individual success. And that's the game that I'd been prepped to play. That's the game that I'd been playing my whole life. It's the game we all play. It starts in kindergarten, right? It starts when we're getting gold stars and extra nap time and extra cookies <laughs> and pats on the head. And then we move on and we get A's and A pluses and awards for excellence in sports and the arts. And then we go to college and the cycle repeats. And then we graduate from college and we get a job where we do something we may or may not like to get lots of money to buy things we don't really want. And the reason that we buy things that we don't really want is to make sure that the economy keeps growing. <laughs> because the game that we're all playing together is the game of infinite economic growth. And that's seeped into how we talk about education. The American Academy of Arts and Letters writes of an education to foster a creative and adaptable workforce. The science, technology, engineering, and math Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math Education Coalition writes of a technology of a education to foster U.S. Competitive, competitiveness and ensure economic prosperity. The thing about it all being about the economy, though, is that the name of the game here is infinite growth. And the thing about infinite growth is that we can't win. <laughs> the win condition is that we keep striving. And it's the same thing in individual success. There's always another A to get, another paper to publish, another gadget to buy, another deal to close, another rung of the ladder to climb. Now, I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. But this, this is a terrible game. And when I remember that, when I can take a step back and remember that it's a game, that we choose the rules we play by, then I can remember that I'm going to graduate without a job and it's okay. I can remember that I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. And that's okay. Because when I remember, I can play. And that playing, that's where magic things happen. On that Saturday after Valentine's, 
one of the people I spoke to was Carl. And I didn't know Carl before. I was walking down the street, and he comes up to me with his arm outstretched. And he says, I just want you to know that I think what you're doing is important, and I really appreciate it. And my intention was to listen, so I tried to get him to talk a little more, you know, hoping that we would engage in a conversation. <laughs> but he had to go to the bank. <laughs> and so we parted ways, and three steps later, he comes running after me and says, hold on. I want you to know that three days ago, a 15-year-old girl killed herself. And I think she did that because she didn't have anyone to listen. What if we gave each other the space to speak? And then what if we listened? Like, what if we learned? What if we taught science not as the truth, but as a process of continuous discovery? And what if we did it not for economic prosperity, but to cultivate a sense of wonder? What if our educational system wasn't built around individual success, but around fostering joy and curiosity? What if we wrote each other love letters? What if we gave flowers to strangers and invited them for dinner at our homes? What if we built giant puppets and paraded them across the parks? What if we danced on the streets? And what if we sang at the top of our lungs? I have no idea what would happen, but I really want to find out. Thank you. <laughs>